You got to get out more, dude. Okay. I'm stuck on this yacht. Yeah, apparently. Yacht? Hey, hey, just... hey, hey. Don't listen to him. You're beautiful. <laughs> The temperature's rising, you're feeling the heat from the Detroit River. Um, well, basically in Windsor, Ontario, we're about to cast off here. Now, this episode is not about Windsor or about Detroit, which you see across from me, but I wanted to interrupt our filming to bring you this very special episode that, at the beginning, was, in fact, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, as he says on his Star Talk podcast. Now, he graciously agreed to join me on board the Pocket Cruiser when we got it to New York City, and we talked about the science of boating. And in his way, which is very entertaining and very educational and informative, he gave so much great information, answering questions that you helped submit, that we wanted to turn it into a very special episode all about the science of boating, and that's what this is. So enjoy. Here is Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and a little bit of me in Manhattan. I did some science classes, and I know that there's formulas, but... Did some science classes? What did, did, did that, <laughs> well, did I don't that code to... for I flunked a few, oh. <laughs> I cut class. Hey, you know what they call the doctor who graduates the bottom of their class? No. Doctor, because yeah. they graduated. So Very my good. 51 in physics counts, Mr. Heath. Thanks for uh, Is tolerating it 51 me. out of 100? Just yeah. to verify. Good, yeah. OK. But uh, so buoyancy, giant ships, super heavy cargo ships, cruise ships. How do they stay afloat, and how do they not tip over? Oh, yeah, so the weight of something doesn't matter. Ever. It's that ma <laughs> <laughs> Your middle-aged man belly <laughs> might matter. Oh. OK, so weight is kind of irrelevant. It's density. That's all that matters. OK. It's density. So in so, theory, you could have a, a, a it doesn't giant matter. ship? Density. Okay. So density is the total mass, mathematically, the total mass divided by the total volume. Okay. Okay? So if you remember how fractions work, if you make the volume smaller in that ratio, the ratio gets bigger. Okay? Right. If the denominator gets smaller. So if you cram that mass into ever smaller volumes, the density goes up. Okay? If you have a larger and larger volume with the same mass, then the density goes down. And all you have to do is get the density to be lower than that of water. And it will float. That's it. And then... I don't care how much it weighs. So how do you do that? We have a huge cruise ship over there. Right. You have battleships, OK? You just have to make sure that there's enough air volume inside, because that's part of the volume of the ship. Right. The metal plus all the the, ro the rooms, the, the mess hall, the, 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 the hull, all of that. So you add up all that volume, that's in the denominator, and just make sure that's, le that's lower than that of water, and it will float, as they do. Power boats, unless it's a paddle wheeler, um, propelled by a propeller, which, relative to the size and weight of the boat, is tiny. How can that generate enough thrust or movement to move. Like, so this boat is 7,000 pounds. The propeller is 27 inches, and it can shoot it through the water for at 30 miles an hour for hours at end. That's the other 49% of your physics class. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I missed a lot those days. OK, OK. It has to do with friction. Right. OK? A boat moving through water, depending on the shape of the, the, the hull, but a boat moving through water has hardly any friction. Did you ever wonder when you come into dock and you toss a rope over, they can just pull the boat in? Oh, but the boat weighs 7,000 pounds. Oh, I'm not that strong. You can completely maneuver the boat. All right. Completely. Frictionless. Little tugboats can move huge boats. Yeah. Because it's not. It's operating against the friction between the boat and the water, 
If the boat is moving slow enough, there's hardly any friction. So right. any force, any force that isn't eaten by friction will accelerate the, the object. Okay. Any force. So no, you don't need huge propellers to accelerate a boat at all. That's the other 49% of the physics class. Just saying. <laughs> 60 seconds of safety this week is all about getting cool on a hot day. So fortunately, a breeze has kicked up here in Port Colburn and it's cut the heat down a little bit. But generally what I and many people love to do with their families and friends on a hot day with a boat is go swimming. One thing you should never, ever, ever do, as inviting as it may look, even if there's a way down to the water, is swim in a marina. And it's very simple, electricity. There are lines running under all these docks into the boats. Even if everything is done perfectly right, there's 700 slips here. All you need is one boat or one issue, and you could have a stray electric current going into the water. You get a shock, it could shock you, you could drown. It happens, it's tragic, and it's completely avoidable. Swimming, great. Swimming in marinas, bad idea. Don't do it. Are we both in it? Is it just Neil? I well, mean, this I'm... doesn't need you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't need you for this. Okay, can you... Again, you got a windshield in the way. Here, why don't I spin it around and then... Yes, good. So, hey, the Statue of Liberty, in case you didn't know, is a gift from France. France. Uh, 150 years ago. And here's just a little fact. Most of the important cities of the world, large population, commerce, are on waterways, as is Manhattan. And so something to consider, that if we lose the ice caps from Antarctica and Greenland, all of those glaciers will melt into the oceans, raise the ocean level until it equals the elevation of the Statue of Liberty's left elbow. Elbow? Elbow. I thought you were going to say, like, the middle of the pedestal or something like Her that. Her left elbow, and that would completely flood all of New York City and every other city that's on waterways, which are m the most important cities in the world, are on the waterways, on the oceans, on rivers, understandably, because it facilitated commerce, transportation, irrigation, all the things that matter when you're building civilization. So climate change leading to global warming it won't leave us extinct, but it will completely unravel the thousands of years of investment we have put in the civilization of cities. Left elbow, holy. Do you know the origin of a nautical mile? Um, it's on the water. <laughs> you own a boat and you fly, and you talk about knots and nautical mile, and you don't know where na nautical mile came from? I sure do, but I think your explanation would be better for the viewers. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I don't actually know why. That's okay. Good. Just to be why clear, a nautical mile is not an imperial unit. Right. Nor is it metric. It's very much its own thing. So it's a little deceptive that we call it a mile, because mile is imperial. Right. But we could just call it a nautical ossoglop. You know, it doesn't matter. It, it is unique to navigation, okay? So, if you take the circumference of the Earth, do you know how, how far it is around? 44,000 kilometers? kilometers? Yeah, yeah, very good, very good, plus or minus. Oh. All right. About 25,000 miles, you have 40, right? 40 something kilometers, all right? But that's not what's important here. Okay. So we've divided the Earth into 24 time zones, and each time zone is 15 degrees wide. Each degree is split into 60 minutes. Each minute is split into 60 arc seconds. They're arcs. Okay. Arcs of angles. Okay. Each arc minute okay. is a nautical mile. Ah. Okay. So there are 21,000, if you do the math, 20, all you have to do is multiply 360 by 60, because there's 60 minutes per degree. 260 degrees in the world. So you multiply it, you get 21,600 nautical miles in our circumference of the Earth. Okay. Well, how many imperial miles? 
25,000. 25,000. Well, if 21,600 nautical miles is the same as 25,000 imperial miles, then one nautical mile is a little bigger than an imperial mile. It's a little bigger. Because yeah. there's only 21,600 of them and not 25,000. So it's like 1.3 or 1.25 or something. You can divide right. those and you get the exact number. So that's a nautical mile. It has nothing to do with anybody's metric system. Interesting. Yeah. Well, everything's bigger on the water, oh, including this yacht. Yeah. You should see it on land. It's only like 27 <laughs> feet. But out here, it's just 200. We're now in saltwater. This started in freshwater in Toronto, went to Montreal, worked our way down. At some point along the Hudson, I don't know how far up, it starts changing. Um, do boats float different in saltwater versus freshwater? Yeah, well, it just depends on the density of the water. And the more salt is dissolved in the water, the denser it is. So things will float higher in under denser conditions, such as salt water. So, oh yeah. And that's why uh, in the Dead Sea, uh, people just love floating in the Dead Sea has very high salinity. And they named it the Dead Sea because they didn't see any fishes in it. But that simply meant they didn't have any microscopes. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of microbes doing the backstroke in the Dead Sea. So, but in a time pre-science, they had no idea. Right. They didn't see any trout, so there's nothing in there. Right, yeah, it must be nothing, because I can't see it with my eyes. Tides are another thing we deal with on the ocean. Did a shoot a few weeks ago on the Bay of Fundy. I love me some Bay of Fundy. Ooh, okay, I'll tell you that, what. Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> if your coastline is like steep, right? then the water level just sort of goes up and down, and you just see the, the, the boats rise and fall, and then that's it. But if your coastline is shallow, then if the tide goes up 10 feet, or we're meters here, about three meters, OK? If it goes up three meters, it's not just going up and down your, 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 you know, your coastline. It's going inland. And so the question is, how far inland is three meters? And uh. so when the tide goes up three meters, it's going to rush into the land to reach the point where it's the same level as the ocean. And if that three meter point is way the hell inland, the water's gonna rush in and the water's gonna rush out. And so the Bay of Fundy has the most tidal friction in the world. Tidal friction? Friction between the moving water and the solid earth. And that friction in total, but especially the Bay of Fundy, is slowing down Earth's rotation. The Bay of Fundy is slowing down Earth's rotation? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nova Scotia, you have some explaining to do. <laughs> you heard it here. I totally listened to that perfectly. OK, so <laughs> since the 1970s, when we were able to measure this, because think about it, if, you're, if, if your measure of the length of a day is the rotation of the Earth, and you measure that really precisely, OK, what happens if the Earth slows down? You would never know it because the rotation of the Earth is your measure. How you would you simply wouldn't know it? So, in the 1960s, we brought in a, a, atomic timekeeping, and so now the second, the length of the second, was pulled away from the Earth. The second is like one sixtieth of the minute, one sixtieth of a of a of an hour, one twenty fourth of a day, one you know three hundred sixty fifth and a quarter of a year. You can calculate what a second should be based on Earth. We offload the timekeeping to the atom, vibrations of the atom. Now we measure the day, and we found out the day is slowing down. So since the early 1970s, 1972, we've added, what is it, 25, maybe 26 leap seconds? Really? To account for the slowing down of Earth. And blame Nova Scotia. <laughs> no, no, there are big uh, tides all over the world right. sloshing in and out. Um, are, have an effect to slow down Earth's rotation, but the sloshing is maximum in that Bay of Fundy. In response to this, the moon is spiraling away from Earth. Really? Uh, inch and a half a year, two inches a year, yeah. So does that affect the tides? Sorry, sorry, uh, four centimeters, five centimeters a year. Uh, no, they're related, they're related. And so the moon is trying to slow us down so that we always show the same face of the Earth to the moon. 
We have slowed down the moon so that it only shows the same face to us. We have tidally locked it. That's why there's a near side of the moon and a far side of the moon. But contrary to Pink Floyd's 1973 album, there is no dark side of the moon. So these two are happening in synchrony, the slowing down of Earth's rotation and the spiraling away of Earth's, of, of the lunar orbit. Interesting. And it's blame the Nova Scotians. Oh, something else that we, we came through coming on our journey down, well, from Lake Ontario into Montreal and then into and out of Lake Champlain, a whole bunch of locks. Um, and like salmon? Like locks? marine oh, locks. <laughs> <laughs> there were no bagels I was thinking, involved. I was thinking bagels. <laughs> what happens lock. when you interview in New York? Get me a bagel and some cream cheese, <laughs> and I'm eating those locks. Okay. So you marine locks. locks. Yeah, sure. Um, how do those doors not give out under the pressure of uh, you know a section of river, a lake? Because um, they're big, but that's a says that's a the lot person of water. who got 51 out of 100 in physics. <laughs> okay, that's why it's mysterious to you. <laughs> Had you done better in physics, right. you would not be asking me that question. No. OK? Right. So you see these doors holding back a bajillion gallons of water. Yeah. And so this say, was covered in a 49%? <laughs> you <think? laughs> OK. You missed that. Yeah. OK? So water pressure has nothing to do with how much water is on the other side of the gate. All that matters is how deep the water is. That's all that matters, not how far back it goes. Okay. So that's why if you look at a cross section of a dam, it's very narrow up top, cross section now, very narrow top, and it gets very wide towards the bottom because the pressure builds, builds linearly, and it keeps building. And so the dam gets wider and wider and wider to support it. So with locks, uh, if you put locks frequently enough in the path, then they don't have to be that deep and that thick. So someone asked me this one, an engineering friend. Yeah. He said, is there a way to separate hydrogen out from water in an efficient enough way that you could use the hydrogen in the ocean to power a boat? Or is the amount of effort to, what is that, electrolysis or something? Yeah, so what you're asking is, uh, what does it take to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen? Yeah. So that when you bring them back together, you have this highly exothermic reaction that is basically used for rocket fuel. Right. The orange tank of the space shuttle yeah. has hydrogen and oxygen in it that they combine, and it has an exhaust plume. And guess what the plume is made out of? Steam. Yes. Water. I was going to say water. Yeah. Ah. The exhaust of a hydrogen-oxygen rocket uh, tank, uh, uh, um, rocket fuel, is water. That's the exhaust. So here's the thing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That would have been taught in the other 49%. The, Energy can never be created nor destroyed. The, the, right? Ish? It's related, but not specifically. Ah. So in physics, if you have energy of a form of a certain variety, and you want to convert it into another form of energy, you will always get less energy out than you started. And you're going to lose some energy to heat. Always. Always. Right. Always. So whatever energy it took you to separate the hydrogen and oxygen atoms within the water molecule, you might as well have used that energy to propel your boat. Don't now use that energy to then put into a turbine to then turn the propeller uh, to, to then run the boat. I got another thing. OK. So there's a bridge behind you, camera, <laughs> in front of me. There's a bridge called the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And I was alive when they built it. At the time, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world, the Verrazano Narrows. And what's funny about bridges is, they tend to be built where ferries used to travel. Right. Where would you put the ferries? Where two points are very close. So hence, that's the Verrazano Narrows. 
Okay. okay? So, because you don't want to build a bridge any longer than you have to, because it would be expensive and you'd uh, bring on risks. So what's interesting to me about that bridge is that the two uprights are not parallel. They're actually at an angle to each really? other. Really? Yes. So you're gonna say, why? Yeah, why is that? Because each of them is pointing to the center of the Earth. Ah, that's how big it is. That's how ah! big it is! Ah! Can I hit you in the camp? <laughs> yeah! OK, ah. they are so far apart that you, because gravitationally, the physics, you want all the forces to go to the center, because that's what you're fighting to keep up the, the, the bridge. So all those cables and the struts and the forces, it's a, so if you made them perfectly parallel, right. yet the gravity vector is at an angle to that, that'll put stress on the system. So they knew this, and so and it's long enough to take that into account. So that's I, a lot so of work I just to thought that was in. the coolest fact when I was like 10 or something, I learned that. So the real art and architecture in engineering comes about when you need a very large span that's high above the water. Then the suspension bridge uh, reaches some of the highest forms of our architectural and engineering expression, in my opinion. Who taught you how to climb? Well, I, I panicked when he went to do it. I was like, oh, I was halfway through, and I'm like, yeah, I don't need to clap. And then I did this little, it's like a weak handshake. It was the lamest clap I've ever seen. <laughs> That's how Canadians clap. I'll allow it. Okay, calculation break. Hold on. <laughs> Got this. No, Archimedes knew this. Archimedes. Right. He'd be so disappointed in you. <laughs> well, that's why he's not on this boat right now. Ah! <laughs> in a boat, you, you don't want to smash into rocks. No. Yeah, that's what I've learned. <laughs> Stay in your lane. Uh, I'll uh, handle the boating uh, details here.